Hello, this is Logar the Barbarian from Wobblies and Wizards, and you are listening to Tale of the Manticore. The following podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Tale of the Manticore, Season 2. Like the creature from which it takes its name, Tale of the Manticore is a mashup, a crossbreeding between two different species of storytelling. Here, you will find the unpredictability of old-school RPG paper and dice games with the storycraft of a dark fantasy novel. No character is sacred, and no character will be spared if the dice decide their fate is at hand. According to lore, the tale of a manticore is barbed with cruel iron spikes. There will be much pain in the days ahead. Last time on Tale of the Manticore. Chapter 10 begins with the party eagerly awaiting word from Lord Rabbit while laying low in Domor until the heat from their various capers in Silmoral dies down. In a flashback, we witness Phelan, henceforth Catsbane, being sworn into the church officially, but his timing could not be worse. Only two weeks after the ceremony, the companions receive news that their job in the City Watch Tower has, in fact, backfired. Their deception has been discovered, and all their efforts have caused significant harm both to the church and to a number of innocents living in the Warren. This all has dire implications beyond the immediate. Yellowfly expects that they, or perhaps just he, will be kicked out of the guild and ordered to disappear forever. By freak coincidence, Yellowfly and Shawnee overhear a conversation one night that turns out to be a real eye-opener. They learn that the tower guard they had slain, and whose murder they had tried to disguise, had recently been married in secret. Although sad and ironic, this alone would not have signified much, but Yellowfly knew the bride. She was a plant for the church. The fact of the clandestine marriage suggested she had fallen in love with her mark, and after learning the truth about her new husband's death, had betrayed them to the City Watch out of bitterness. In the final scene, Yellowfly confronts and tricks her into confessing her crime against the church. Yellowfly is redeemed. If it hadn't been for that conversation between the two merchants and the Happy Harpy, I'm really not sure what would have become of him. I think his life with the church would have been over, at the least. When he and Shawnee were eavesdropping, I mentioned that there were three pieces of information that would be valuable to have. Shawnee failed her hear noise check, so they only learned one, the fact of the secret marriage. Of course, that turned out to be enough, but would you like to know what they missed, just for curiosity's sake? With a successful check, they would have learned that Wedron was not, in fact, a teetotaler, but a more than occasional drunk. The story about his temperance was spread by Lolly to protect her new husband's memory. They would also have learned that Lolly visited Wedron's grave every morning before she began her workday. This last piece of intelligence might have encouraged Yellowfly to confront her at the cemetery, where there would be almost no chance to be seen. Of course, if he had done that, he wouldn't have been able to trick a confession out of her, so maybe that failed role was a blessing in the end. Regardless, in D&D a failed role usually has a negative consequence and I think there should be some price to pay for Yellowfly's arbitrary good luck in overhearing even a little of the merchant's conversation. What that means is that there is a chance Yellowfly is spotted by, well, someone without his best interest at heart when he returns to Silmoral. Nobody is specifically looking out for him, but that doesn't mean the authorities and the Weeping Eye are not on high alert. I'll say that there is a 1 in 3 chance of his presence being detected. A 1 or a 2 on a d6 indicates that that has happened. I'm really hoping Yellowfly's luck will change, but it's really in the hands of the dice gods. Here's the roll. I've got a five. I'll be honest, I was so sure he'd be unlucky, I'd already started figuring out who and which faction had clocked him. Fortunately, I can put that danger aside for now, and poor Yellowfly will finally be able to find a scrap of respite. Chapter 11, Part 1, Day 48, Morning. Party status, Yellowfly, 15 of 15 hit points, Tamlin, 7 of 7, Cole, 8 of 8, Shawnee, 8 of 8, Catsbane, 4 of 4. Spells available, Tamlin has prayed for, 
Cure light wounds. Cat's Bane has memorized. Read languages. Autumn in Silmoral was a beautiful time. Days were warm and nights were comfortably crisp. The roses that bloomed in summer were gone, but sunshiny marigolds had taken their place, and they could be found all over the city, not just in the wealthy districts near the castle. But the truly dazzling colors occurred outside the city's walls. The mostly deciduous woods that grew between the various farms mutely sang with burning orange, golden yellow, and blood red. In addition to the beauty, autumn was a time of plenty. The harvest was a good one this year, and Silmoral enjoyed a bounty of pumpkins, potatoes, and apples, among many, many other fruits and vegetables. By now, six weeks had passed since the tower and warehouse missions, and most of Yellowfly's gang were feeling impatient for a return to action. Most, but not all. Tamlin seemed to embrace the downtime. The men had changed so much recently. He seemed older and much more comfortable in his skin than he had before. He exuded a calm that made the others want to be in his presence. Tamlin had spent much of their downtime tending to Cole and Shawnee. The apothecary's salves and poultices had played a role in their recovery, but it was Tamlin's ministrations, especially his prayers, that had made the biggest difference. Neither Shawnee nor Cole would have described himself as a spiritual person but they could not deny that their healing had been unnaturally quick and that they had returned to a state of health that should probably not have been possible. Most of Shawnee's burns had disappeared under Tamlin's care, and Cole's neck showed only light scarring. When he replaced their bandages and said his prayers, happily embellishing with stories and parables of Shartoon, they could feel warmth emanating from his hands. Tamlin had taken to wearing his orphan key on a leather cord around his neck. He touched it frequently when he prayed, and it seemed always to shine. Presently, the group was breaking its fast on fresh bread from the bakery below their apartments. Even though they had become used to having hot meals while living at the Harpy, it was nice to be back, and the bread was warm and good. They had arrived yesterday in the evening, and Yellowfly had, annoyingly, not been home to greet them. They had all waited up for him, eager for news, but when he finally showed up, he just slurred out that he was too drunk to talk and went straight to bed, where he passed out in his clothes. He looked somewhat fragile today, and they noticed he wasn't eating. He sipped a cup of water instead as he spoke. There's good news. And bad, he said. Well, let's have the bad news first, said Cole. The bad news is, Yellowfly began. Here he surveyed the line of grim faces looking back at him and interrupted himself. There's no dagger in a red sheath for me. The others relaxed visibly. But that's the good news, so first things first. The bad news is that Captain Sinwon has been seen wearing his medallion in public. Several times, in fact. He has also been seen in the company of Balak. They've been socializing together. So it seems that not only has the church lost its leverage over Sindwan, but we've managed to create a friendship between our enemies. Balak clearly understood what we were doing and figured out a way to turn it against us. He's smarter than I gave him credit for. So now we'll have the two of them working together, which could mean a lot of trouble, especially. He took a little drink of water, sipping at the cup as though it were a tonic. Shawnee finished a sentence for him, especially because of that map you found. Correct. Belloc's either investigating the Eye or else they've bought him. I would tend to believe the latter. At least there's good news to balance it out, said Tamlin. No red dagger. Not for us. Turns out we were betrayed by one of our own. But I fixed it. He didn't explain further and they didn't ask. Also, Yellowfly reached down to the sack on the floor by his chair. He had brought it home the previous night and slept on it like a pillow. He slipped something out and laid it on the table. There's this. It was the cipher Shauna had taken from the safe house. Lord Rabbit was glad to get rid of it. He said he tried a dozen times. Each time he thought he had the key, he found he was beating the wrong bush. Said it almost drove him mad and was keeping him up at night with his mind racing in circles. And we've had the key all along, said Tamlin. Isn't that right, Katzbane? Hey, I'm Tim. And I'm Mike. And we are The Watchers on the Couch, a television show discussion podcast that doesn't take itself or the shows we watch too seriously. A recap and review show that is for immature, mature audiences only. No offense, but what the f*** does that mean? Well, that means in addition to recapping and discussing shows like Game of Thrones, His Dark Materials, and Westworld, we ask the questions that are lurking in the deep recesses of your mind. The ones you can't bring up at the office water cooler. Like, how does Daenerys know that all her dragons are boy dragons? Those are the only genitals we never see on Game of Thrones. We release new episodes weekly, usually on Wednesdays. Sort of depends on the show we're covering at the time. 
Watchers on the Couch is completely free to listen to and available on any app that supports podcasts and on YouTube. No, but seriously, we saw those dragons flying from all angles, and there's never any dangly bits. Well, maybe it's like a turtle's head. I mean, The Hobbit would have been a way different story if Bart the Bowman could have just shot Smog in his dick. Chapter 11 Part 2 Day 48 Morning While the party broke their fast in the Warren and Yellowfly nursed his hangover, the men and women at the Church of the Sacred Flame were well into their workday. They had woken before dawn to perform their morning ablutions, attend guided meditations, and then go to their various work or studies. It's just up ahead, said Brother Ligo, and Sister Savan followed closely behind. She giggled, and a thrill shot through him. They were probably not supposed to be there, in the subcellar, alone, but there was no specific rule against it. And you say it is a secret passage, truly? She had an appealic accent he found endearing. Well, it's not a secret any longer, since we all know it's there, but it used to be a secret. And it was really used for... (laughs) She laughed again. (laughs) To Brother Ligo, it was the most beautiful sound in the world. Indeed. Some priests and priestesses, it seems, were not as serious about their vows as others. They reached the spot where an iron lattice door with a massive padlock blocked the way into a small passage. This passage led to a narrow flight of stone steps that descended into total darkness. Oh, it's just so exciting. Just think of it. Oh, he had. Brother Ligo had thought of it, fantasized about it many, many times over the past few months. Until today, he had never actually brought her here. He told himself he was just giving in to her requests to see it. But after all, why had he even told her of the place if not to bring her here? I should so like to see what it is at the bottom of those steps. She breathed. Then Brother Ligo felt her hand touch his shoulder. Yes. He managed. As would I. He immediately thought. More than you know. But then he realized that, of course, she did know. That's why they were here. I do hope we aren't discovered. Oh, how exciting. Will you go in first, or shall I? How will we see? Is there a lamp we can use? Oh. Brother Ligo chuckled again. We can't actually go inside. I don't have the key. Oh. Came the flat reply. He didn't have to turn around to see the disappointment in her face. He could imagine it clearly. He had memorized every inch of that face, every freckle. No, no, of course I don't. Brother Niles has it. He is the keeper of the ground. Brother Niles, repeated Savan. She removed her hand from his shoulder. You know, I'm ever so thirsty. I think I shall go back upstairs. Farewell. And with that, she left. He saw her many times after that, but she never again smiled at him. Instead, she now gave her smiles and her laughter to Brother Niles, hanging from his arm, laughing at his awful jokes, and slapping him playfully when they were a little too risque. Brother Ligo watched all this with jealousy and even hatred rising in his gorge like so much bile. Did Sadal not teach that the most painful thing in the world was a faithless and fickle woman? Well, he told himself. He would never have actually done anything against his vows. But he knew he was kidding himself. He would give it all up for just a moment with her. Having to see her every day was torturous, but the worst was yet to come, because one evening, he saw the two of them steal away together, toward the subcellars, to the secret passage, looking over their shoulders like a pair of thieves. Chapter 11, Part 3, Day 48, Late Morning, Party Status. The party status is unchanged. Catsbane had tried to explain, but how do you distill years of study into a few sentences? In the end, he told them he was offering a kind of trade to an extra planar creature. He would surrender to the being the use of part of his physical body for a little while and in return the creature would share whatever information it learned during its time in his body. This explanation produced a solid line of blank stares, so cats being settled for the caveat instead. They might not care much for what they saw if they decided to stay and watch. 
Of course, a warning like that only guaranteed an audience as he prepared to cast the spell. He was sitting at the kitchen table with the cipher open in one hand and a quill and parchment ready in the other. Well, don't say I didn't warn you, was all he said before muttering the incantation and closing his eyes. For a moment, nothing much happened, and his assembled companions started to give each other sidelong looks. Then Catsbane's eyes began to move back and forth behind their lids as though he were dreaming. Finally, and this brought low gasps from the spectators, a little horizontal slit opened in the center of his forehead with a bright purple eye visible within. It flicked around, taking in everything it could, before its gaze came to rest on the pages of the cipher. Hungrily, it scanned the lines of text, and Catsbane's right hand started to move as though of its own accord. Words, then lists of words, and then full sentences formed under the nib. When the ink ran dry, the hand moved quickly to dip it in the inkwell without Catsbane, or his hosted entity, even looking. This bizarre activity went on as Yellowfly, Shawnee, Cole, and Tamlin looked on from a distance, variously enthralled, disgusted, and disquieted. When the spell ended, the purple eye retracted into the middle of his brow, the horizontal slit sealed, leaving no mark, and Catsbane's eyes opened. He blinked a couple of times, and then inspected the paper in his right hand. He gently blew on it and began to read. His companions approached cautiously, which made him crinkle his eyes in mirth. They slowly took their seats at the kitchen table as he gave his report. For the most part, the cipher enumerated supplies, purchased to sustain nobres, that is, the safe house owners, series of guests, food, drink, washing, and other sundry items. There was a list of the past six guests and the dates describing the start and end of their stays. The first four were called Bryant, Eilie, Gotrick, and Tulwin. All four had come and gone before the summer, before Catsbane had arrived. His own name came fifth, and then the name Romela, sixth. She had only been there for two days. This, then, was the name of the woman who had escaped by using some kind of magic to make Catsbane and the others think she had stabbed him. He had never learned her name or anything at all about her, as she had insisted on being alone when they had lived under the same roof. Yellowfly was also unfamiliar with the name Romola, but he said he would ask Lord Rabbit later in the day. The rest of the cipher produced two additional items of interest to the party. One was an entry with no context found on the final page. It was two words combined to form the single word, Iron Wolf. Perhaps it was a passphrase or a codename of some kind. Finally, Catsbane noticed multiple entries indicating money owed to Nobre for delivery of food and supplies to a sawmill in Mirpool. Mirpool was a little fishing town east of Silmoral, no further away than Domore. It was a strange thing, Catsbane pointed out, for Nobre to perform such a menial task, unless there was a reason to keep it a secret. Perhaps it would be worth investigating. Yellowfly thought it probably would be. He knew Mirpool fairly well and wasn't aware of any sawmill there. Ultimately, he said, the decision isn't mine to make, Catsbane. Lord Rabbit expects me this evening for another night of drink and dice. Yellowfly was looking green again. If my brain and liver survive the night, I might be able to share some thoughts on the matter tomorrow morning. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go outside and throw up a little. Dramatis Personae Yellowfly Yellowfly is 29 years old, but looks as though he were in his middle 30s. His hairline is receding, and he has a premature widow's peak. He wears perpetual dark circles under his brown eyes, and generally appears drawn and in need of a good sleep. Not helping this look is his reluctance to shave regularly, and so most often he can be seen with several days' growth of beard. At six foot two, Yellowfly is tall. He makes good use of his stature in a fight, where his long reach gives him a distinct advantage. His weapon of choice is the longsword, and he prefers to fight without the encumbrance of a shield. Yellowfly was born and raised in Clearwater, a small fishing town at the far eastern border of Camertine. The people of Clearwater are typically no-nonsense, hard-working folk who can handle themselves in a fight. As a border town, and one without any walls at that, confrontations with raiders of both the human and inhuman kind are not uncommon. Yellowfly is a big-hearted man who values loyalty in others above all. He's slow to make new friends, but once a bond is forged with someone, he will never betray them. It is as much his quality of unwavering loyalty as it is his skill with a blade that has made him such an up-and-comer in the Church Thieves' Guild. He's a favorite of Lord Rabbit's, who recognizes his value to the organization and also genuinely enjoys his company. 
As good as he is, he has not always been a thief. When he was an adolescent, he went by his birth name and, as his father still used their small boat to fish daily, toiled as a fishmonger. He discovered that he had sound judgment, a good head for numbers, and could negotiate circles around most other merchants. He began selling the family catch to taverns and then armories. His line of work took him often to Rayford, Mirpool, Rull, and Domore, and, very occasionally, as far as Silmoral. Yellowfly fell in love with the capital the first time he saw it. It was also during this first visit that he was robbed for the first time, and by the church no less. He ran down the pair of thieves who had stolen his cash box, and, through a twist of fate, ended up befriending them. Those two thieves turned into longtime friends. Their names were Jesmond and Donick. The three of them were inseparable and recklessly daring in the way only youth can be. They made a small fortune on a single wildly successful job. Truth be told, it was more due to good luck than skill. Chartoon must have smiled upon them that day. Soon after, both Jesmond and Donick retired from active membership in the guild. The former would eventually lose all his money to gambling and become something of a drunk, while the other would purchase an inn and tavern on the outskirts of Domor, named the Happy Harpy. As to what happened to Yellowfly's share of the take, well, that is another tale for another time. Chapter 11 Part 4 Day 48 Evening Carrick, the basilisk of Whitestone Castle, drew his hand down over his face and slumped in defeat. Another attempt, another failure. This was the sixth time he had pitted his skills against the ward and been beaten. Whoever had cast this spell must have been a mighty sorcerer, more powerful than he. In all of Camertine, Carrick was known to be the strongest wielder of magic, and so he would have sought out the mage responsible, except that he suspected the person was dead and had been dead for at least 200 years. He had studied the records from the reign of King Vincis, the warrior king, who had snatched the throne from Queen Thanusia in the 323rd year of Camertine's history. He knew that Vincis' own mage had struggled with this very same barrier. The history said it took him a full year to wear it down enough that he could pass. But he had passed, while Carrick could not. He had been trying for over a year, ever since he had received the anonymous letter. Well, it wasn't exactly anonymous. The folded paper had been sealed with a blob of wax bearing an unfamiliar insignia. His research had provided no clue as to its origin, either. The letter had arrived one day, brought to his tower window by a raven who, once the letter was delivered, collapsed into a pile of ash that sifted away and scattered it in the breeze. The spidery writing within addressed him as friend and provided instructions for finding the secret entry to the ruins under Whitestone Castle. Scholars had debated the existence of such ruins ever since the reign of the Paladin King. It was referenced in a number of holy writings, most of which were housed at the Church of the Sacred Flame, but no one had ever been able to locate the entrance, and eventually the existence of the place had taken on the status of myth. Since the letter, Carrick had spent almost all of his time on this top level of what he believed was a complex that cut deep underground. He had made only a little progress. By passing a handful of wards and traps, he suspected that these were meant to be minor hazards, but they attested his skills to the fullest. He was aware that the more time he spent here, the more he neglected his duties on the surface. Culfrey was becoming vexed by his absence, and Carrick had completely missed some situation concerning his new apprentice. He couldn't even remember the youth's name. He looked at the back of his hands, the papery skin, loose and pale. He was an old man now, and frail, but he should very much like to see the other side of this portal before he left this world. But how it resisted him. This room, with its crumbling stone blocks, might be as far as he ever got. There was only one way forward. It was blocked by a door crafted of some unknown metal and magically sealed by a master of their craft. A life-sized androgynous face had been worked into the metal of the surface. It looked vacantly at him now, just as it always did. Tell me, what is your weakness? He whispered to the face. There must be some weakness in your armor. What is the key that will let me pass? But the thick metal door simply shone dully in his lamplight, with the hollow eyes of its face looking straight through him, neither in mockery nor challenge. What is the key? Thank you for listening to Tale of the Manticore. If you enjoyed the show and would like to help to support it, there are several ways to do so, including a new one. 
As you know, I have a couple of items on Drive Through RPG. One Shot in the Dark and Encyclopedia Medicorica. But I've just added a third. It's something I mentioned at the beginning of Season 2. Pendulum is a world-building tool. Its sole purpose is to help you generate the history of a settlement. I built it and used it to make a history of Camertine before I started Episode 1 of this season. I won't get into a detailed explanation now. Instead, you can expect a demonstration episode in the near future. That episode will not be related to Tale of the Manticore or the World of Merith in any way, by the way, so there's no risk of spoilers. Pendulum is up on DriveThruRPG right now if you'd like to take a look. Of course, I also appreciate every single recommendation, like, retweet, rating, and review the show receives. I'd like to read another one of these great reviews right now. This one was posted to Apple Podcasts by Draquanaut. Draquanaut writes, Caught the trailer for this podcast and was intrigued by the premise. It's an excellent idea, well executed. It captures some of the flavor of the old school basic D&D adventures, but with a tense narrative that keeps you guessing. The random element creates some plot twists. Can't wait for the next installment. Thanks so much, Draquanaut, for supporting the show with that very kind review. These reviews really do make a difference by encouraging folks who might give the show a listen to actually give it a listen. My thanks also go to the folks who lend their voices to the show. Hodag RPG is back in the role of Brother Lego, Cleric of Sidal. He plays alongside Cassie Derby, host and GM of the Party Advantage podcast. These two sound awesome together in this scene, I think. Kyle is back as well, briefly in his usual role as Catsbane. And I'm happy to introduce another newcomer to the show, Josh of Mudbeggar Games, who takes on the role of Carrick Melmar, the Basilisk of Whitestone Castle. Thanks to all my voice talent. Your contributions really bring the show to life. For listeners who use socials and would like to reach out, I'm on the usual ones, at Manticore Tale on Twitter, and Tale of the Manticore Podcast on Instagram. And there's always email. Write in with your comments or questions to taleofthemanticore at gmail.com. The adventure will continue on the next episode of Tale of the Manticore, the story where chaos rolls. Mr. Witch and Mr. Light have an agreement with a group of hags who call themselves the Hourglass Coven. You see, they can come and go into the Witchlight Carnival as they please to steal from naughty patrons. But what happens when those patrons come back years later looking for those lost things? Find out as Wizards and Wine takes on the wild beyond the Witchlight. Two tables playing through the same adventure. One table more thoughtful, kind, and bold in their actions. The other table more decisive, more adventurous, a little more prone to taking risks. The actions of each table influences the gameplay of the other. Find out how it all shakes out with Wizards and Wine, the wild beyond the witchlight. You can catch the podcast on your favorite podcasting platform, and you can catch the live stream on Mondays. Find us on YouTube and Facebook. We hope to see you at the carnival very soon. <laughs>